afternoon talk. So the, the first speaker, I'm pleased to introduce uh, Shane Montan, uh, professor uh, and chair at uh, USC. He'll talk about uh, smooth analysis you know, the last half decade or so. Uh, I think I have all the voice now, right? So, uh, so Tim, thanks a lot for the wonderful workshop. It's terrific. And uh, uh, this is actually the first time uh, Dan Spielman and I uh, gave a talk on smooth analysis in the same conference within the span of three days. Uh, I'm very happy that he covered most of the technical components, uh, especially surrounding numerical analysis. And here I would like to focus on uh, some of the recent studies of multi-objective optimization, machine learning, and the game theoretical problems uh, from the angle and the lens of smooth an analysis. Uh, I greatly enjoyed personally this uh, series of study, in part because I was able to work with uh, uh, real experts, uh, with you know the domain expert uh, in those uh, subjects, which at the beginning of the investigation I actually literally know nothing about most of those problems, and I'm very glad for that. Uh, you know, my colleagues Heiko taught me about multi-objective optimization. Uh, Adam and Alex, who is sitting somewhere, uh, it, it, it taught me about uh, uh, pack learning, machine learning. And uh, Xi Chen and Xiao Tian taught me about game theory. And of course, throughout, Spielman has been teaching me everything. Um, <coughs> so uh, to continue the discussion of the theme of this workshop, I would like to start a little bit slower uh, give me some chance to, for discussion, and also give you some chance to get used to my accent. So hopefully, when I reach the technical part, uh, you don't have to error correct me that much on my English anymore. So, so clearly, modeling the uh, uh, practical behavior of algorithms and also the practical difficulty of problems has been a challenging problem. For example, this paragraph uh, uh, come out from a, a a writing for an NSF report uh, by the leaders of uh, uh, my field, theoretical computer science in 1999, uh, beautifully illustrated the challenge. And it's actually also highlighted, for example, the simplex algorithm and uh, 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 similar annealing as two of the uh, practical algorithms which could potentially inspire uh, more rigorous analysis from a theoretical angle. And it also highlighted in blue, for example, the importance of uh, experimental work to the theoretical modeling and the development. So it's a very, you know, it's beautifully written uh, paragraph. And the document is equally nicely written. And uh, <coughs> so, so the, the, simple, uh, the linear program you mentioned <coughs> in the paragraph uh, is something we all are quite familiar with. That is, uh, we are seeking to maximize or minimize a linear objective function subject to a set of linear constraints. Ax is less than or equal to b. And when the linear constraint is feasible, then the region will be a poly, uh, uh, a convex, poly, uh, convex set. And uh, so, uh, so, so the, the standard simplex algorithm or approach essentially takes two phases. In the first phase, it essentially try to determine whether the region is feasible or not, or is unbounded towards the direction of your direction of optimization, because you will have infinitely good solution. And, and or if you decide not uh, unbounded or infeasible, it will actually return an initial solution on the exterior of this polytope. And in the second phase, it will apply a standard local improvement algorithm, or locally greedy, or local search procedure and essentially continue to improve the objective function. And the nice thing is that due to convexity and linearity, this local search will always end in a global solution, globally optimal solution. Right? So, so this approach has been uh, proposed you know, more than half century ago and has heavily used in financial world and industry. And uh, it has many interesting theoretical uh, features. So, for example, in the 70s, uh, a series of work essentially illustrate that almost all the pivoting rules for the simplex algorithm 
runs in exponential time in the worst case. So almost every design, they have uh, one family of uh, worst case uh, linear program, somehow defeated polynomial uh, convergence. And uh, <coughs> then at, at early 80s, uh, by assuming, for example, the matrix A is a centrally symmetric, like Gaussian matrix, the average case analysis has been conducted to illustrate that you know, if you have such a random linear program, then uh, the simplex algorithm, at least some variation of it, some versions of it, will run in polynomial time. Right? So, so it has sort of interesting features, you know, the, the, the worst case feature, practical feature, and average case feature. Right? So, so one of the main challenges uh, in modeling you know, the practical performance of algorithm is uh, sort of data modeling. How do we model data? How do we model real data? So this, you know, seemingly intuitively simple problem, you know, everybody feels I understand my data. And suddenly when you try to model it, this seemingly simple problem becomes extre extremely challenging and often impossible to do, right? So part of the reasons of this challenge come from the fact that uh, most algorithms are designed to handle many data, not just individual pieces of data. On the other hand, you know, individual users are interested in the performance, whether it's time complexity, whether it's quality of the algorithm, you know, on the data that they care, that they encounter. Right? So this discrepancy actually are often the source of the difficulty. And more than that, the distribution or the subset of the instance occurring, you know, <coughs> is often vary from user to user, right? So, you know, we Chinese have an idiom. Uh, in Chinese, it's a zhong kou nan tiao, meaning it's hard to cook for many. Well, verbally, it means that uh, it's hard to design a taste that will make many more happy, right? So. So here, essentially, it's almost like the same scenario that is there's so many individuals, so many angles, and, uh, and theoretically, how do we come out one way to somehow to make everyone happy? It's, you know, it's virtually impossible. So, uh, so traditionally, <coughs> you know, theoret theoreticians recognize it's virtually impossible to make everybody happy. Let's just choose one at least objective that we can conduct meaningful in our mind, insightful for at least understanding algorithm. So that is a worst case analysis. So uh, worst case analysis has many wonderful features. One of the features is that uh, uh, if the measurement is uh, good, that is an absolute guarantee. Right? Doesn't matter what input you receive, it will give you a virtual absolute guarantee. But on the other hand, one of the features is that it can be conducted without understanding the data. Because it's a virtual guarantee. So just like, you know, some tourists come here and uh, want to go to Yosemite and say, uh, how much elevation should I prepare to go up? Then you answer, 29,000 feet, right? Because that's the highest peak on the Earth. Clearly, it's a virtual guarantee. And the person says, oh, good. I'm going to Oregon too, how about Mount Hood? You said 29,000 feet, right? It's an absolute guarantee. But on the other hand, you really don't need to care about what they are need for that particular instance. <clears throat> so uh, to often overcome that uh, sometimes the, the worst case instance could be uh, pathological or rarely occurring in practice, uh, a variety of average case analysis has been introduced. So in a traditional scheme of average case analysis, we define a distribution, we conduct, for example, the, the expected analysis, right? So there, the challenge, again, is that how do we design a meaningful distribution that A is subject to mathematical analysis and B is close to practice, right? This trade-off is actually very challenging. So. Uh, you know, it's hard to cook for many people. So, uh, so, so our colleagues in numerical analysis and in op optimization, you know, op operations research, as you know, Dan's talk uh, illustrated, they often conduct 
a slightly variation of uh, uh, analysis, which is slightly more instant based. So in particularly, for example, they often study the dependency of the performance and uh, something called condition number. So somehow you want to give input a, uh, another quality measure, and somehow you relate that quality measure with uh, the performance. So for example, the precision needed for Gaussian elimination uh, depends upon the, you know, essentially logarithmic of the condition number of all the principal minors uh, you see during the elimination. For example, the conjugate gradient method for solving symmetric positive definite matrix, the number of iterations depends upon logarithm, a uh, square root of the condition number of the matrix. Right, so they have this type of language. For example, interior point method, uh, at least Renegar's version, depends on logarithmic in the condition number defined for linear program. So they have this so-called uh, instant-based uh, quantity which allow one to measure the performance. For example, the perception algorithm, uh, the, the number of iteration depend upon you know, one of the polynomial of the, this wiggle room, right? So it's all very much like in the, in one parameter, parameter tradition of the complexity. And, uh, but in theoretical computer science, we do conduct far beyond worst case analysis traditionally. It's not just uh, in the last many years. Actually, way back in 60s, 70s, there are several studies built upon, you know, not completely worst case analysis. So I will broadly classify them as the so-called property based analysis. So for example, one of my favorite results in this uh, setting is uh, the beautiful result by Lipton Rose Targin. They prove that, uh, you know, if your linear system, the underlying graph is planar, then you can solve those linear system in time essentially n to the power 1.5. Even though, in the worst case, Gaussian elimination may take approaching quad, uh, cubic time, right? So they said, you know, if your linear system comes from, for example, two-dimensional simulation, two-dimensional graphics, most likely they can be solved much faster, and that is a property of the input, right? So, for example, inspired by that, uh, you know, uh, <coughs> Gary Miller uh, uh, and lead his group I was part of also produced many results which essentially say if uh, 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 the graph comes from finite element simulation, then certain performance can be achieved. Right? It's a one property. So, so in that context, for example, I just want to highlight one result. We were able to show, even though in high dimension, the Lonely triangulation, this beautiful object in geometry, can be computed you know, quite slowly, n to the power d over 2. But if you know they come from a good data, from numerical simulation, then in fact, there's a linear time algorithm to construct the Lonely triangulation. In fact, it actually takes constant time if you have n processes. Everything really becomes much faster. So, so clearly, there's many work, which I'm not going to enumerate, uh, apply this special property, like on power law graph, on expanders. And uh, for example, we heard a discussion about uh, doing con competitive analysis, assuming the data come from certain Markov model. Right. And also in this talk, uh, in this workshop, we also saw several more extensions of uh, quantify the complexity based upon input and solution properties. Right. If the solution and input has certain properties, then somehow using those properties, one can design a faster algorithm. Right. For example, our first talk by uh, uh, Arum uh, talked about you know, if the output has certain properties, then you can compute it faster. Okay. So back to smooth analysis. So this, uh, uh, so smooth analysis, uh, in smooth analysis, we also, in many ways, combine this notion, either explicitly or implicitly, of this property-based analysis, right? And we happen to use one particular property that I would like to give at least a quick intuition because Dan already presented the overall framework. So. So there, basically, we began to look at data model, and fundamentally, we try to apply this thing called the simultaneous certainty and uncertainty property, or what we call imprecision property. Right? So then eventually, we combine this property with a traditional framework, like worst case and average case, to essentially design a measure. So to illustrate this property, uh, let me just give you one example, that is uh, uh, we have one person at least from IBM. I, I actually, do, what is IBM stock today? 
173. So, so if you ask this question, what is IBM stock? If I ask you tomorrow, what would be IBM stock? It's not 173 anymore, potentially, right? But if I, tell, if I say, you know, IBM stock is zero, they'll immediately say, no, that cannot be, right? If I say IBM stock is a 10,000, then you say, that cannot be either. But if I say tomorrow IBM stock is 200, you said it's possible, yeah, it's possible, right? So IBM stock, if you ask what is IBM stock, it's really this curve. Right, so this is a certain uh, simultaneous, you know, certainty, uncertainty, right? Because if I say zero, you don't believe it. And if I say 200, you say it's possible, right? So we are not talking about a single number. It's not a single input. So, so one possible way to think about this thing is that uh, IBM stock is defined by two numbers. <coughs> one is its intrinsic business value of this company. And then the second part is that when the market take a measurement, the market induce an imprecision. Right, so it's really that the imprecision can potentially come from market, and the reason we said it's not zero is because there's the intrinsic business value. So, so this seems to be, you know, if you ask many people, you said that if IBM stock is a, a number plus noise, most people say, yeah, that sounds about right. Right, because the market make a pre, uh, measurement. In many ways, many practical data come from measurements. And there's often imprecision in the measurement, but there's a fundamental value. Right, so, so, so as a first cut, a first order approximation, one can often write certain practical data, as, you know, a piece of data plus a potential noise. And depending on the instrument of measurement, the precision of noise may vary, right? For example, market typically carry I think five to ten percent noise. Some day two percent. Some day maybe fifty percent. But uh, mostly carry a much smaller noise than the intrinsic value. Right. So, so essentially, the, the smooth analysis is designed to combine this imprecision property, and we then design a measure on assuming that the input satisfies this particular model. Right. So. Uh, I borrow from Spielman's slides, as uh, Dan illustrated in his part of the talk, that we basically design uh, uh, this measurement as this continuous measurement. Uh, it measures both the input size and also the precision of the noise. And, uh, and the formula as a schema combines both the worst case and average case. In the grand scheme, we want to study the, you know, the arbitrariness of the, you know, we don't define IBM uh, uh, business value, it happened to be. We cannot say IBM business value uh, is not what they are today. So that's, if we want to do uh, investment, you know, we have to use the, that value percentually as it is. And, but the market does give us small degree of imprecision, right? So, so, so we basically con consider this continuous landscape of measurements, and if this measurement is small, it basically indicates that uh, in every neighborhood of, in the neighborhood of every input, the, uh, the performance on average is good, right? So which means that if the, the practical data has a little bit of noise, then uh, it's very difficult to see a worst case uh, example, right? Oh, that's because very often the, the, the type of problem we study, uh, the, the data, you know, are. Uh, there's an invariance when you scale the data. So, uh, you know, uh, <coughs> but there's many refinements one can put in. Yeah, yeah. So, so in this context, uh, for example, the slide Dan actually didn't put up, and uh, uh, he said, I wish I had that slide, so I put it in for him. So essentially, we were able to show that in particular case for linear program, linear program, for some variation of the simplex L algorithm, we're able to show that if our linear program comes from measurements, you have a noisy part and the intrinsic part, we're able to show for every intrinsic part, as long as you have noise, that in expectation, the simplex algorithm runs in polynomial time uh, as a function of the input size as well as one over the uh, degree of noise. Okay, so, uh, so in this talk, I would like to basically uh, uh, 
discuss some of the recent study uh, by expanding this view to a few other area. Okay. Why poly in So 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 there's two answers. One is uh, there's a so mathematical facts. Sometimes this is the best possible you can prove. And for some other scheme, indeed the dependencies are log of the uh, uh, imprecision. So those could vary from problem to problem. I will actually present another very even challenging problem. You cannot even achieve this. Yeah. But in general, if you think about it, the data representation, we typically use you know, double, you know, single or double precision. Right? And now the, our input size is you know, a billion, for example. A you know, few hundred million. And normally, currently, we are using you know, about uh, 100 bits. And uh, you know, that's almost like constant times log n. So that could give you the noise level there. And in such a result, it does imply a polynomial assumptions. Yeah. So, so I would like to also use each of those examples to highlight certain facets of smooth analysis. Right? So for example, in the machine learning case, I would like to discuss where do we study noise. And in the multi-objective optimization, I would like to talk about partial perturbation models. So, <clears throat> so this is one of the uh, area probably many of you know far more than me, and because I never took any classes in machine learning. And Adam and uh, Alex gave me quick lessons on the subject. So, uh, uh, so this year's Turing Award winner, uh, Valen, introduced uh, this learning scheme, essentially saying that uh, if we receive data from certain distributions, uh, labeled data, then we would like to create an estimator, which hopefully will be accurate enough to predict the future data, if it's drawn from this distribution. So that's the, sort of the high level uh, idea of the scheme. And uh, um, so there, basically, in the learning, it is quantified into an algorithm and data collection. And the complexity is basically how many data you need to see in order to get accurate enough. Right? So for example, we often say a, a polynomial time learning algorithm is the one that, by looking at polynomial amount of data, drawing from this distribution, we, have, we can get reasonably close, for example, 99% close to, to the future evaluation of the function. You know, the, uh, those estimate the future disagreement of the function. Okay, and there's many subtleties in the framework. For example, in Valens' ori original framework, he assumed that uh, the original function comes from a certain family, and he's also learned from that family. For example, original function comes from decision tree, you're learning from decision tree or some other re representation. And since then, those framework has been expanded. For example, one particular one is called agnostic learning. Namely, uh, you don't even assume the original function comes from a particular family, but you are learning from a particular family. You want to do the best possible from this family. Okay? So, but, but the language is very similar. You draw, you're receiving data, and then you try to build a a, a, a classifier, you want to be as accurate as possible. Okay? So, <clears throat> so when I was, began to talk with Adam, he, he basically illustrated the following. He said that, you know, if you think from information perspective, if you see many, 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 many data, you should be get absolutely close. The really challenge is the trade-off between the computational limitation, how much you can do, and how accurate you want to predict. Right, so it's a fundamental trade-off. And uh, so essentially, if we ignore computation, by seeing a lot of data, we should be able to go as very accurate. But on the other hand, uh, uh, when we limit the computation, he mentioned that even the following simple example, we don't know there's a polynomial time algorithm. The following simple example is that imagine you have Boolean function, even just exclusive or of a few variables the parity of few variables. And suppose you were not told which variables are the featured in this function. Suppose you even only have log n variables. You know, Tim chose log n variables. He really care. He, he made this exclusive or function. And suppose the distribution is just uniform. Then Tim basically say, okay, figure out which log n variable 
I got. If you get all my variables, I invite you for a dinner. And, and Adam basically said, this so far the best algorithm is n to the power log n. It's not even polynomial time. Even though there's a particular distribution, like uh, uniform, and it's a very simple function, just an exclusive or of uh, log n variables. So he called this Hunta problem. And he mentioned actually many uh, fairly simple looking uh, function are not that easy to learn in this framework. Right? And uh, Adam draw the following slide. I didn't do that. And uh, so, so, but in the view of uh, Valen and uh, Adam, he said, you know, but children learn. We have kids, we watch them, they look at the very few data, and they learn beautifully. Right? You know, I worked with one of Les Valent's kids, uh, Paul Valent, when he was in high school. And I can clearly decide that he learned in constant time uh, very quickly. So, 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 but even though the Hunter problem couldn't solve in logarithm into you know, polynomial time, right? So, uh, so in this context, you know, Alex, Adam, and I uh, began to look at some of the partial explanation. And I'm not sure that we get everything to the precision or uh, right intuition about this problem. But at least we feel there's one particular result. Uh, however small they are, they could be quite interesting. Right, so, 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 so we basically considered that uh, imagine that your distribution has some fundamental noise. The function has no noise. You know, this concept is concept. But the distribution of data has a little bit of noise. Right? But currently, we can only handle for technical reasons so called product distribution. Namely, <clears throat> when you have n Boolean variables, each variable are independent and they have their own means. Right? For example, uniform distribution is a, a product distribution with half, 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 half. Right? You, you flip n perfect coins. And maybe sometimes your distribution comes from a third, a 25%, 75%, half, and so on. Right? So this is called product distribution. Right? So, so we are considering the following framework. Uh, I put the result up, but that, let me just explain uh, more intuitively. Uh, and that is, uh, imagine that uh, you have a fundamental distribution come from product distribution. Each variable has their means, you know, mu1, mu2, and all the way to mu n. Right? It could be all half. And then you know, you, 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 you went to China factory to say, could you produce a coin for me, which when you flip will give this uh, precision of you know, head and tail. Right? And then the coin came back with 1% error. But that's become your natural distribution. Right, because uh, when you really produce distribution, that's, you know, you can only use your coins, right? So what we are trying to say is that uh, imagine that uh, the distribution itself has, you know, some small fraction of imprecision. And here, assuming the distribution, the product distribution. Then we are able to show that, uh, for example, for all decision trees, including this Hunter problem, which uh, uh, illustrated earlier, uh, in fact, you can learn in polynomial time. Assuming that you, you know, the adversary does not hold a perfect coins. And that is the distribution you're doing in the measurements. Okay, so, so, so naturally many of the steps of proof went through some basic technical uh, setting. It actually it took me a long time to learn through this. Even though Adam promised me those are just basic, trivial things which people, everybody learn in machine learning. So I will skip those, but I will mention one highlight lemma which in some sense implies through this family of results. And this family of results, uh, which uh, Dan also hinted in, uh, in his talk, he didn't use the word called non-concentration bond. Essentially, in smooth analysis, often we prove so-called non-concentration bond. Instead of proof things that concentrate, we prove things non concentrate. Namely, we want to prove that bad things don't concentrate. Right? So, here, for example, a very simple non concentration bound eventually leads through all the analysis for, for, for at least uh, our uh, sequence of work. So, this non concentration bound is following that imagine you have a multi linear polynomial of degree d, and suppose you knew one of the leading monomials of degree d term has a large enough coefficient. Right? Let's say one. You, you don't care about the, the, the coefficient of any other 
uh, terms. But you knew one of the leading terms, for example, x1 to xd, as coefficient 1. Then we are able to show it's almost like an extension of Schwartz uh, Zippo uh, theorem for uh, testing polynomials. Then we're able to show that this type of polynomial, if you draw data uniformly from negative 1 and 1 cube, it does not concentrate well against 0. We cannot quite concentrate at 0. So in fact, the concentrate at 0 is precisely the problem with uh, solving this Honta problem, because uh, uniform distribution had a hard time against parity. And uh, somehow you concentrate, uh, you know, uh, perfectly at zero. This is an accidental cancellation. But here, if you couldn't concentrate, you can't, this accidental cancellation was eliminated. And uh, so, so then, you know, due to the brilliancy of Adam and uh, uh, Alex, so uh, we are able to show this lemma imply actually uh, identification lemma. You can somehow layer by layer identify which variable is prominent, and then you can do interpolation among them. So that's essentially the learning algorithm. That is, you try to recognize wh which variable, which terms are important, and one can show there's only polynomial number of terms are important. And, but this lemma allows you to uh, show that uh, uh, because of the noise in the distribution, if you uh, get enough sample, you're able to extract out the features, and then you can do interpolation. Right? So that's essentially the outline of this proof. And uh, so here basically said, independent of what type of uh, Boolean functions we study, as long as in product distribution, if there's small degree precision, imprecision, then suddenly this framework of learning actually can be conducted in polynomial time. I mean, to, is there ever an even stronger result which would say you, you can handle anything away from half? Um, it seems like I have a conjecture at the end, so I will address back to this issue. It's actually kind of cool, small technical conjecture, but it could be quite a fundamental lead to other analysis. Yeah. So, 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 so by doing this, we actually achieved a lot of bond that can be achieved by membership queries. So essentially, a lot of places, by using much powerful learning mechanism, you can learn. And here, we basically, in this traditional you know, receiving data framework, we are able to accomplish like, certain aspects of agnostic learning and so on. Okay. So, so that's basically this sequence of work. And I mentioned the, the only one uh, first part of the result. So, any other question up to here before I switch gear just a little bit? So, 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 so on Monday when Dan was giving his talk, he said, you know, clearly there's a lot of limitation of smooth analysis, in part because, you know, it's just a first order uh, abstraction of some phenomena. And naturally, in order to be more powerful as a mathematical tool, we would like to uh, have better understanding when the limit perturbations are more limited, right? But in a lot of settings, we are not able to somehow carry through. For example, one area he really wants to do is uh, to do zero preserving perturbations. And so far, we have very limited success. And uh, so here, basically, I will talk about one particular area. Somehow, partial perturbation uh, is sufficient to derive polynomial bound, OK? So this is in the area called the multi-objective optimization. So, you know, in computer science, we stand, we traditionally study optimization, like MP hardness essentially are, decide, are de defined either for de decision problem or optimization problem. And uh, so, in this framework, we have a single objective function, we have a constraint, and we want to optimize, right? For example, linear program, shortest path, TSP, and so on are defined in this framework. But in practice, often we consider uh, more than one objective functions, right? Just that's the nature of what our consideration. So, for example, if you travel from Europe to here or from Asia to here, you have to consider by, when you buy ticket, there's multiple parameters. You know, you want to minimize cost, you want to minimize delay, you want to minimize the number of hops, right? When you buy train ticket planning, sometimes you do that too. And when you do routing on network, you may simultaneously want to minimize. Uh, the, 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 the length of message and also increase the chance the message will go there in case of something, right? So, so the reliability, for example. 
And very often, you know, we consider multiple objectives. And uh, so this is often called multi-objective optimization. And uh, in abstraction, it means that we have constraint, and we have several objective functions that we want to optimize. Right. So, so the question is, uh, how do we do this? And very often it's very difficult, right? Because uh, the object function may not all agree, and uh, you have to make trade-offs. And very often we have very incomplete information about trade-offs, right? So, so traditionally, uh, as uh, what I call mathematical engineering, and we try to help the decision maker to simplify their task. So one of the ways to simplify their task is that we eliminate any potential solution that they don't care. Absolutely under no condition they care. Right? So we try to give them a supporting set and they can choose a farm. Right? For example, whether you go, want to go to be a baseball player or you want to be a professor. We give a very few choices. Right? So, uh, so, so one notion here is so-called Pareto optimal namely build upon dominance. For example, if you have two objective functions and you want to minimize, under no setting you will prefer y over x. Right? Because x is better than y in every direction. Right? So that's what you call dominant. And in general, basically, you can label the set of points of feasible solution that cannot be dominated by nobody. Right? So this gives you also called the Pareto set. And uh, so geometrically, basically, you know, each Pareto point can eliminate other points. And their geometric structure actually define so-called Pareto curves or Pareto, Pareto surface if you go to higher dimension, right? Lack of drawing power. And uh, so, so one way we can help the decision maker is that to output the Pareto sets, that if they change their mind about their monotonic function combined with this feature, we knew that uh, their solution has not been eliminated, right? So, so one of the computational problems is that we clearly want to compute this set fast, and we are hoping this set is small. But if this set is too huge, then they will say, we don't need you. We will do it from scratch, right? So, so one of the central questions here is that how large is Pareto set? It's a very tricky problem. Right. So it's actually very easy to design multi-objective function to have exponential number of Pareto points. For example, if I have two objective function, one is negation of the other one, then clearly every feasible point is Pareto. Right. If you win here, you lose there. Right. Or you can make small perturbation as of those. So, so here basically, uh, uh, in the uh, spirit of smooth analysis, we consider the following a uh, small family of uh, multi-objective optimization, what we call the linear binary optimization. Some of those can be extended to integer optimization with a limited domain. Okay. So essentially, we said that suppose we, our feasible solution is a subset of hypercube, and uh, I have essentially d linear objective function. Right? For every node of hypercube, I have you know, W1, W2 to WD. I, when I do dot products, I give you objective function. And then basically, this is my multi-objective function. I want to ask him how, how big is the Pareto sets. Okay? And it's actually fairly uh, broad language. Because, for example, multi-objective TSP, multi-objective minimum spanning tree can all be captured this way because that's a summation of edges, right? Where the Boolean variable is whether you have edges or not and you have a coefficient of its length or cost, right? So, so, so this is a fairly broad language. So in the worst case, as I mentioned, it can be exponential. In practice, which is usually small. For example, there's this nice experimental work from Germany. They study the sort of train connection in German system, where train is very reliable, always on time. So, so they are able to conduct this analysis to actually uh, show that you, do, you have a very small number of Pareto points, even though you have five or four objective functions. So, so, uh, so we consider the, a partial perturbation model. That is, uh, imagine that your coefficient of the objective function has small noise. But here, the combinatorial structure is absolutely absolute. Right? For example, if I give you a graph, 
you want to consider minimum spanning tree. I cannot perturb your minimum spanning. It's spanning, minimum spanning tree. You have to be feasible. Right? So we have no change on the subsets. The only thing is, you know, edge lens could have a little bit of noise. Right? When you measure the lens, you may not be precise enough. So that's all the noise you have. Right? So in this setting, basically, in your linear objective function, the wi has a little bit of noise. And uh, the, the, the subset, S is absolute a subset of the hypercube, cannot be perturbed. That's what you call the feasible set. Right? If you want to fly from you know, Europe to uh, San Francisco, you have to arrive here. You cannot be perturbed into Portland. Right? So you have to come here. So those subsets are absolute. Okay? So, so we are able to show, for example, uh, under the, this small degree of noise, if the objective function is only constant, then we, we are able to show that the Pareto points actually is polynomial. Right. So I'm not going to present any proof of this, nor this bond, because this bond is the most embarrassing bond I ever proved as a constant. It, it actually is a, uh, has a defectorial in the exponent. And uh, since then, uh, you know, uh, Uncle and uh, Ryan O'Donnell uh, greatly improved this result, and he's giving his talk shortly after me. So I will completely leave to uh, Uncle to, to argue for whether it's practical or not. And my bond is not two to the defect, you know, it's n to the defectorial, so. so which, is, which is worse, defectorial or ADE? <laughs> which was your previous embarrassment? Yeah, I think I'm probably more embarrassed by ADE, actually. <laughs> defectorial, at least in my head, it has short connotations. So uh, they are slightly embarrassing. Uh, but so, do you think that, uh, let's say, this type of results explain why in the German train uh, uh, schedules there are like... I leave it to Uncle to, to defend and explain. I knew with defactorial, I can't go anywhere close no, to that no, number. No, no, but like, <laughs> do you think that the reason, let's say, why in the German train system there are few Pareto optimal points, the reason is because something like smooth analysis is going on there, or the tool reason is something I, I personally do not have any idea on this thing, yeah. It, that is an inspirational story for me so far. Maybe, maybe Uncle has a deeper insight on the connections. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> so, so, so I'm entering my uh, last part, which, uh, so because the whole exploration of the, any model is every model has limitations. I mean, the limitation is not just how close we can measure practice, but also limitation what we can analyze. Right? It's not, sometimes it's not just mathematically what we can analyze, and sometimes it may not be true anymore. Right? The, so, so here, basically, uh, it, you know, since we began to conduct this study, uh, we have always interest in natural problem that somehow uh, the, the, the worst case solution are stable. Right, because they offer different mathematical structure to the problem. And uh, so essentially here I would like to mention some of the uh, 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 realization of fairly natural phenomena that the worst case instance are relatively stable. Right? So this is what I call the game and optimization. Because I, I was mostly talk about optimization so far. And uh, so somehow uh, this type of study eventually lead some of our investigation into uh, you know, uh, game theory. And uh, so, in order to make a, a quick connection, I'll also give you a little bit small break. I will give a short introduction of the connection in my own video. What is game, what is optimization, and what is related with, with what I just presented. So, so, so optimization, traditional one, is that we have many decision parameters. We have constraint. We have single authority, you know, President Obama. And he needs to cite all the parameters to optimize our economy. Right? That's optimization, this constraint, the decision parameters you need to set to optimize. Right? And uh, <clears throat> so there basically, as we mentioned, there's many studies could be related with the global optimum, local optimum, or approximations. Right? So there's, there's some partial analysis of smooth analysis has been conducted in this area. And uh, most of our investigation lead to a a positive result, namely somehow noise did improve the solution space. Okay, and 
As we move to multi-objective optimization, the scheme changes just slightly. That is, instead of having uh, one objective function, we suddenly have several objective functions. But again, we still have a single authority, namely President Obama, and he's still deciding on all the parameters, and he wants to make USA happy, California happy, and uh, uh, even though we may not care about Connecticut, but uh, uh, still, he has to care about Connecticut. He has to make trade-off, right? So this is often called multi-objective optimization. And for example, Pareto optimal is one of the solution concepts in that domain. But I'm sure there's other uh, trade-off uh, solution space over here, right? Pareto is just one of the particular solution space. And uh, so here is my view of a game. It's a sort of natural extension <coughs> of multi-objective optimization. So again, we have multiple objective uh, functions. Now we have many decision makers. Each decision maker has their own objective function, but their function depends upon the decision parameters of everyone, right? Because you know, California economy does depend upon the economy of other states and the country, even the world, right? So this is sort of uh, overall dependency, but the individual player make individual choice. And hopefully, in this global setting, they optimize optimal enough, right? So, for example, Nash equilibrium is essentially built upon this framework, and building on this notion called the best response. It roughly says that imagine you are the lucky last decision maker. What would you do? Then clearly, you just optimize for yourself, right? And if next day another governor says, I will want to make the last decision, then the setting changed. So it clearly creates dynamics, right? Because each individual's best response resets certain parameters. You have to reevaluate, you need to continue to move forward. So, so, so Nash fundamentally studied this dynamic and saying, you know, uh, some setting are stable in the sense that uh, it doesn't matter who is making the last call, it's good enough. He said, that's good enough. Everybody said, that's good enough. Right? It didn't mean optimal everywhere. It just say everybody said, it's good enough. There's nothing more they can do to improve their own situations. Right? So that's the sort of intuitive notion of Nash equilibrium in the context of optimization. It's a sort of many individuals, many objective functions, and they could have you know, trade-off among individuals. Right? So in this setting, our study of uh, uh, smooth analysis have a sort of uh, a natural question early on. So in fact, actually, after Dan, I just published the result on the simplex result. We had a visitor from a Duke University. His name is John Rife. He came to MIT. I think I remember in Spielman's office. He asked the following question. He said, uh, "What is smooth complexity of lambda Hausen? I didn't remember Spielman's response. All my responses, I don't remember what lambda Hausen algorithm in detail. And I just weakly remember it related to the games, but nothing more than that. And I don't know what Spielman's response at that time. I don't remember. You don't even remember that. So, so, so essentially, many people turn out ask this question. Because in their view, the, the, the Lambic-Hausen is some kind of a simplex-ish algorithm on two polytopes, rather than like simplex algorithm is on one polytope. So it's a fairly natural extension from, as a scheme. Right? So, so, so John basically asked, you know, if you have noise in your two-player games, then can Lamke Housen convert efficiently? So that's a fairly well-defined problem. For example, here, two-player games are one of the basic matrix form games. Uh, uh, I think some of the introduction I already made here. Uh, so essentially, you have uh, several actions for each player, and e each player has their payoff matrices, and depend upon the setting of both actions. Right, so that's why I often called two by matrix game. You have two matrices, this is a complete information game. And you can you know, define mixed strategy, namely what is the distribution of the action you want to take. You can talk about expected payoff. And in this context, one can define the uh, Nash equilibrium. So uh, mathematic, as a mathematical programming, one can write out an equilibrium is a sort of distribution that uh, uh, individually, you cannot flip your part to improve your expected performance. 
right? So it's, this is a quadratic form. And uh, this approximation notion can be defined. Namely, you know, if you change, you only improve by 1%, you don't care anymore. Or 1 cent, you don't care about anymore, right? So, so this is a sort of uh, both approximation as well as exact computation. And notch proof, independent of A and B, for any, every A and B, solution already exists. Right? So mathematically, it's a settled problem. Okay. And uh, computationally, what we are interested in is uh, you, if you give me matrix A and B, how quickly I can give you one equilibrium. So that's the simple problem. Okay. And uh, a related uh, setting is uh, in some basic economic setting. For example, in the simplest setting I learned, it's called it is exchange economy. Namely, when you have a collection of traders, uh, you have a collection of goods, assuming it's sort of infinitely divisible. And then initially, everybody has an endowment, like farmers came with uh, fruit, and uh, uh, some people come with iPhone. I need to update my image now, with iPhones rather than, uh, with, with CDs no longer important anymore. Uh, Cuban cigars probably still powerful. And then, but the individual has utility functions, right? So, so the fundamental problem there is how do you design an exchange so that everybody is happy enough? Right. So the question about what is happening in us is defined by this uh, mathematical equilibria for exchange. So this is actually very computational. Uh, in the view of Arrow de Bruyne, and they basically said, uh, suppose you have this virtual distributed particle that everybody come to the market sell to virtual market, assuming that there's a label of a price. Suppose your government announces the price, everybody go to virtual market and just sell. You don't care about who he's buying, and you got your money. And then you go back and to buy from the virtual market, which is the union of the good, to optimize your objective function. Right? So, so then, so-called correct price is the price that somehow cleared the market. That after this virtual exchange, everybody gets a fraction of the market, and the union is precisely the market. Right? Nobody has money in the pocket, and there's no fruit. Uh, grapes on the market anymore, right? So everything is cleared, right? So again, uh, under mild condition, this equilibrium already exists. The question is how quickly we can compute the one or uh, approximate the price, right? So, so in this setting, we become much more interested in, for example, expanding the smooth analysis, you know, assuming that each coefficient has a little bit of noise, right? So people's payoff has a little bit of noise. Right, and uh, so 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 this is a a, 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 a very active area uh, for recent study, and uh, a breakthrough result in 2005 by uh, Daskal, Kis Goldberg, and Papa Dimitro, was was done at Berkeley, essentially showed that uh, if you have three player games, then they are so-called PPAD complete. Namely, if you can solve the find equilibrium for three player games, then you essentially can solve every family of this type of equilibrium problem in polynomial time. And uh, so in a quite stunning result by uh, Shi Chen and Xiao Tie Den in 05, uh, they show that uh, uh, actually two player Nash, which uh, the one I draw, uh, actually is also PPAD complete. And uh, so, uh, so in our search for, a pro, uh, for the smooth analysis result, we proved an intermediate result to show that actually it's hard to approximate. That you cannot compute an epsilon Nash equilibrium in a polynomial one over uh, epsilon time. And uh, so essentially say this is a family of problem, a polynomial approximation is as hard as just solving exactly. Okay, so, so this, Last uh, theorem somehow settled the smooth complexity and gave up evidence that this is actually a challenging pro setting, that the worst case example are very stable. It's actually said that uh, the, uh, the two player game doesn't have a smooth polynomial complexity, provided the P uh, PPAD is not in RP. Because uh, if you perturb a two player game a little bit, you get an approximate solution if you solve exactly there. And since you couldn't find an approximate solution, which means that the perturbation 
still result in hard instance. Right? So, so somehow, the connection between approximation complexity and smooth complexity here, uh, uh, and the hardness of approximation, leads to a proof without doing probability that uh, you know, the smooth complexity of two-player game uh, is, may not be in, uh, polynomial. So it's different from the uh, simplex algorithm. Okay. So this gives us a, some quite natural setting. Uh, somehow, it's a very natural problem. The worst case instance is highly stable without uh, conducting a probability analysis. It's just, you know, the sequence of approximation result implies that you cannot somehow perturb your way out. Right. So this can be also extended to the, the uh, exchange market. Okay. So, so, so we did this context and also optimization. And uh, uh, the PPAD, basically, according to uh, Papa Dimitri, it could be a sort of uh, a picture in between P and NP. And uh, uh, Megiddo actually has a result to show that it's unlikely they are the whole NP, because uh, uh, if you have NP complete the problem there, then I guess core NP equals NP, right? So, so which means unlikely, unless certain miracle in complexity landscape, uh, it's unlikely this will be the entire blue. And uh, so PLS is another family. Again, it's unlikely to be uh, NP complete. Uh, otherwise, NP is equal to co-NP. Okay. So, so this blue landscape is where we actually have some limited success in smooth analysis. And this area is one which we have totally no success in smooth analysis. So somehow, the mathematical structure here must be sophisticated enough. Somehow, uh, there's a lot of fractals in the, in the domain of solution. And when you perturb, you continue to stay in the hardness instance. So, so, so I think like Michael, I'm listening to <laughs> columns. So here is a local search and a fixed point computation. And uh, so here is my sort of frustration on one hand, and the other hand, we are celebrating certain results. For example, in linear program, uh, not only the world pushes it into P, a weekly polynomial, we're able to conduct smooth polynomial analysis. And, uh, but in the uh, game setting, the, the, the parallel problem, the two-player game, uh, uh, whether it's in a, a smooth model or in the worst-case model, they both seem to be hard. And here, basically, for the uh, local search, there's a trivial Foley polynomial time approximation algorithm. But on this side, also, it seems to indicate approximation is hard. Right? And uh, the one which makes me feel this side probably is harder than this side is that the local search is very intuitive, right? Because we have this landscape like mountains. We want to go down. We always know somehow there's a, uh, somehow we feel we understand topology here. But the PPAD, I guess it's only intuitive to Crystal Papa Dimitri and a few other people in, in the field. I often get very confused in, in this landscape. And uh, so we, we did ask questions across this landscape. Is, uh, uh, it's a fixed point fundamentally harder than local search, and this is still unsettled the problem. Although there's one small result we were able to obtain a few years ago, so asking in the black box model, who is easy? Namely, you can query for for fixed point, or you can query for value for local optimization. So there's an early result by Aldosh in '83 showing if you allow randomization then local search can be sped up. Even though deterministically, worst case, uh, fixed point and uh, local search has similar complexity. They seem to be all behave very similarly. But uh, if you allow randomization, all those show that you can dramatically reduce the search space for local search. But on the other hand, we are able to show randomization does not help fixed point computation. Of course, Oracle model hides a lot of things. And I don't fully, you know, this is the first time I write the paper in Oracle model. Actually, I do not know what's the danger in this model. Many people warned me to say Oracle hide too many things. So, but nevertheless, there's a sort of reasonably natural separation between these two families. Okay. Two minutes, uh, three minutes to conclude. 
Okay. So, 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 so let me uh, conclude with, uh, uh, you know, Tim obviously, do you have a concrete question? So I, I think usually he asked that way. I feel in my talk I will end with a, con a few concrete open questions, whether you like it or not. Some of those I'm currently working on, and uh, they seem to be quite uh, mathematically interesting. So one question related with the, uh, uh, this little non-concentration uh, bound. So, so Adam, Alex, and I were able to show that if you have a multilinear polynomial uh, with constant, uh, with, with the largest term coefficient one of degree d, we are able to show that you cannot concentrate against zero. So, we worked on this pretty hard for uh, I think almost the entire summer when we were all in Microsoft New England lab. We were still not able to settle the following variation, which is seemingly true. I did quite a few experiments. They look fairly true. That is, imagine you have a, a multilinear, which is critical, multilinear. It's not a polynomial. Multilinear polynomial of n variables of degree d, and the constant term is 1. But you can have n to the d terms with different coefficients. And we would like to show that if you draw uniform random from 0 and 1 for each variable, you cannot highly concentrate it at 0. So clearly, when degree go up, you will be able to concentrate, right? Because the function x1, x2 to all, uh, times xd highly concentrate at 0. But, uh, uh, but if you plot minus 1, you can get x1 minus 1, x2 minus 1, so that's highly concentrated at 0. Right, so you can't get a constant of one, you highly concentrate at zero. But currently, if we limit the degree and enforce the multilinear, and our strong belief is this cannot be highly concentrated at zero. And uh, uh, very often when I'm flying around, when I'm cooking in my kitchen, I think about this conjecture. Uh, uh, it, I think it's true, it may lead to some other algebraic analysis. And uh, uh, so if any of you has ideas or solve this problem, I will be very happy. So, uh, so, 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 so this is a, often when we conduct a smooth analysis, we somehow eventually reduce to some kind of non-concentration setting. Sometimes it can be complex, but in this particular case, uh, th this particular conjecture was derived initially when we tried to conduct the agnostic learning setting. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, Adam basically said, if this conjecture is true, then he has a proof. But eventually, he got a proof without this conjecture. So, so somehow he went around this conjecture. He, he proved his real out. And, uh, uh, but nevertheless, in my, in my head, this seems to be a very clean algebraic problem. Are you willing to accept a polynomial and n term in front of the Yeah, I, I'm willing to set a polynomial in n. Here, I, I don't want to have polynomial in anything d in the exponent. You can even say cubic. That's fine, too. So you can see I choose 0 small possibly means to concentrate at zero, right? So, so, so I, I'm, I'm able to give a weaker polynomial floating anywhere. But uh, uh, the dependency I want, to, so essentially my d is roughly log n. So, so basically you can think about d is log n, right? d is log n. Then you can, allow, I, I'm happy you put in polynomial everywhere. And, uh, but the, on the exponent, I don't want you to have any degree of y over d. Because that's trivial, and also it's essentially not a very useful bound. But, but without depending on d, it seems to be the, this linear function, right? Multilinearness somehow. The linear function leads to that. So, so this is one of the sort of hopefully clean enough, simple enough conjecture. And uh, <coughs> so the second uh, set of conjecture is. Uh, uh, you know, since uh, uh, Xicheng and Xiao Tiedeng introduced me to game theory, uh, I began to read a little bit more of the papers in game theory. In fact, one of the first papers I read is from Tim on the potential game. And uh, so at that time, I was thinking, what smooth analysis can be done for a potential game? And here is actually one very simple conjecture, which is still open. And my postdoc, Jialing, and I are working pretty hard in the last period of time. We still didn't solve this problem yet. So that is, uh, there's a very simple game that in my head, it's the simplest congestion game called the max cut game. Okay, so here is the max cut game. You have a complete weighted graph. 
the WIJ. And uh, so, so that each individual is, a, uh, you know, this is, a part, uh, this is a game, right? So initially, suppose you have a partition of left and right. Then each, each individual, you ask, would you like to go to the other side? If it, in, it increases your cut, suppose, you know, the cut is, uh, the, uh, the edges, the weight is an uh, indication how much you don't like people there, right? Next cut means that you want to go to a party, maximize the cut, which means uh, maximize the dislikeness of the other party. Right? This is a natural game, and it's a potential game. So this, you can easily show that every such a move, there's a potential function, will drop exactly the same as your dislikeness. Right? So this game has to convert because it's a potential game. And there's a case to show that it may take an exponential number of iterations to convert. And here, uh, I'm asking this very simple question, that is, uh, imagine the weight has a little bit of noise. Or even just random. Imagine the weight is random or noise, zero, between zero and one, or in a smooth model with a perturbation. Uh, I would like to show that from any initial partition, this sort of uh, uh, response dynamics will convert into an equilibrium in polynomial steps. So you don't particularly care about the value of the cut that you get? No, no, I don't. I just, this is a game, right? So if you reach stability, I'm happy. So you get a half approximation, essentially? I, I, yeah, the, overall, the dislikeness is not our problem. We just make sure each individual feels they're in the right party. That's all. Right? Each individual is in the right half party. We don't know. Yeah, we don't know. So this is a very frustrating study so far, and but it seems to be a very simple problem, right? And this can be, for example, extended into some other uh, uh, similar game, like this is a scheduling game or cost sharing game. I'm not going to get into detail, but they all have very similar phenomena, namely if a lot of weights and they will converge. The clearly, it's just zero one, you will convert in polynomial time because every step you will gain one, right? This polynomial bound you will convert. Here I'm talking about the arbitrary weights from zero one. Okay. So, again, if you have any idea, I'm happy to hear about it. If you solve it, I'm uh, happy to hear about it too. So, so yeah. this is the same as the local search algorithm. Yeah, this is just local search. Yeah, but uh, uh, after I read the Tim's paper, I said this is a game, <laughs> right? But this is exactly one of the local search, right? You're just swapping, right? Right, so the game just uh, uh, inspired more of my students to think about this rather than this optimization problem Then none of my students want to work, work on it anymore. Right, so, but it is a local search in disguise, yeah, yeah, okay. So, 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 you know, as Dan said, you know, it's very hard to conduct smooth analysis for iterative dynamics. And uh, so in a simplex algorithm, we are lucky enough, there's a simple geometry allows us to go through. And so far, the most complex simplex, uh, the, the iterative analysis came from uh, uh, Arthur uh, uh, Manthe and uh, Heiko Rogelin. They successfully, recently, to show lowest k-means clustering converging in polynomial time in a smooth model, right? So k-means clustering is this very, uh, 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 widely used uh, heuristic for data mining. That is, uh, imagine you have n points, let's say in some constant dimension, 50 dimension, and then, then you want to produce in k clusters. So you choose k centers, that, then you build a Voronoi diagram, everybody go to their nearest center, uh, and then basically uh, you will recompute the center of gravity, it produce k more centers, and then everybody go to the nearest center, and you repeat this process. So Lloyd observed that uh, uh, this process is a potential in local search. So I don't, uh, I, I'm not going fancy anymore. Here is a good audience. So this local search process, uh, you know, every time you update your center, everybody go with the close center, and there's a potential function will uh, fundamentally reduce, and hence, you know. Uh, after a certain number of iterations, they have to convert because you have finite number of configurations, right? Exponential number, but finite number of configurations. So, 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 so in the worst case, even in two dimensions, this takes exponential time to converge. 
And recently, uh, 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 this group of researchers show that uh, if the point has a small degree of noise, then the noise algorithm actually went down polynomial iterations. And uh, so there, somehow, they can overcome this uh, 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 fundamental challenge of uh, if you keep on going, and, uh, uh, going down the step, you're losing your randomness. So they are able to have certain uh, structured techniques for this particular problem to go through. Right. So uh, I was hoping that somehow those te techniques can be applied to max card game or scheduling games or other local search problems. Yeah. So, so, so essentially, the, 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 you know, analyzing the uh, iterative process and dynamics could be an interesting uh, direction of study because it will enrich our power to do probabilistic analysis. And uh, I think even in the days of ran average case analysis, these are also the challenging settings because, uh, uh, you know, uh, when we look at a random variable, it's no longer random. It doesn't matter how long we look at them, right? So it's a fundamental challenge in the iterative uh, analysis. And uh, so we would like to also sharpen our ability to prove the non-concentration bound, which could be a good technical direction. And uh, uh, but in the context of this uh, uh, workshop, I think looking for better input model, uh, in, in particular for discrete problem, could be a very fruitful area for continuous study. And uh, so with this, I conclude there. Thanks. Because if you 
say everything was multiples of sigma, you know, you just sort of cut cut the low order bits off. So it's, just, it's, easy, right? so it's all yes. about those those low order exactly. things, right? So if you truncate, it's trivially polynomial. Because most of the congestion game, if you truncate, which means that every step you can make a significant progress at the precision. So here basically just that you know if you're noisy and uh, so, th so this, we are walking on the boundary of this subtlety of the, yeah, so, I mean, in my own mind, it's very it's strikingly interesting, you know, yeah. How important is the distribution of noise, for example, in that uh, learning example that you gave? I think we, ha we are heavily constant, uh, uh, we, we are heavily constant, uh, you could go by, with one hour log. Uh, like different other, types of distribution. Other, we cannot go to one hour root n. Root n is bad, right? So, so there's certain. Uh, I think one hour log is fine, but uh, beyond that, we, we don't know right now. Yeah.